He's about 455 yards away. He's going to hit about a two iron, I think. This is the School of Motion podcast. Come for the MoGraph, stay for the puns. Hello again, and welcome to the School of Motion podcast, where we talk about all sorts of things related to this wonderful industry that we call motion design. My guest today is a Renaissance man. He's scary smart, and he has this amazing ability to synthesize information and to speak eloquently on topics ranging from education to business to politics. And he's also bald like me, which makes me like him even more. Meet Michael Jones, the founder of MoGraph Mentor. Have you heard about MoGraph Mentor? Many of our alumni go on to do this intense interactive program uh, after taking our courses, and then they rave about it. And in this interview, Michael and I talk about the future of motion design education, the origin of the MoGraph Mentor program, and we even get into the weeds a bit about education in general. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did. And uh, that's it. Let's meet Michael. Michael Jones, my fellow Baldite, it is so nice to have you on the podcast, man. Thanks for coming on. Yes, thanks for having me. So for anyone listening who is unaware of MoGraph Mentor, I suspect a lot of people have at least heard of it. Um, But could you just start by telling us a little bit about the thing you're mostly known for in the industry, which is MoGraph Mentor? Yeah, MoGraph Mentor is a mentorship program where you sign up for a 12-week session and it's all project-based and you have one, two to four, it can really depend, hour-long sessions once a week for each of those 12 weeks in which you kind of present your progress for the week, um, get various demos depending on who your mentor is and then getting critique and then kind of peer discussion time. So it's just that idea of making work, having kind of a small group. We limit the group sizes to six people per group plus the mentor. So you could have seven people in these web conferences. And uh, the goal is just to match the right students with the right artists. And hopefully they can learn about the, the technical side of it, the professional side of it. And then, of course, the artistic side of it. We want them to grow there, too. So just kind of a holistic approach and then spending a lot of live hours together in those web conferences is essentially uh, the whole the whole idea. That's amazing. It's I really want to dig into um, because the way you do your classes is very different than the way we do ours. You're you're trying much harder than we are to emulate the live class environment. I want to get into that a little bit. But um, let's start with sort of like where all this came from, you know. I feel like now in 2017, you describing that sort of setup, that business model, it's like, okay, yeah, that makes total sense. There's other people doing that. But when you started this, I had never heard of anything like this. So where did this come from? Yeah, there were already some groups doing it. I had seen some really great examples, the the closest being Animation Mentor. So our names are are pretty similar. Interesting. Um, yeah, no, it's it's not totally novel. I think it just started to become obvious to people that there was this incredible efficiency in these new teleconferencing technologies. And then, you know, the fact that you can pair people with working professionals, you know, like a Lucas Brooking, let's say, who spends his day at Buck, you know, right on the front lines of trying to understand how to provide value as a visual artist and animator and filmmaker for clients. And then, you know, Sunday morning, he spends three hours with six students. I just love the thought of those six students being able to interact and get um, get wisdom and information and all all those various things from someone who's kind of in the position that they directly would like to have theoretically. So, the efficiencies are so obvious um, that it just kind of felt like an inevitable thing. And I think I've told the story a hundred times before, so we don't have to go through it all, but just, you know, I felt like it was a good idea for a couple of years and just kind of thought, well, but really qualified people should really do that. You know, who am I to really do that? Some of that, you know, self-limiting expectations type of thing. Um, But then eventually it just was like, you know what, let's just put this together. Let's start reaching out to these artists, see who would be interested and just kind of start the journey and, you know, who cares if we fail, who cares if, you know, in my mind, I thought like maybe if we have 10 to 12 people, you know, just 10 to 12 people we work with, I would consider that a worthy use of my time. Cause that would be really interesting. I would get to know these people. Um, so it's, it's grown so much more than we expected. So it's nice to kind of keep your expectations low and then just see what happens. But 
Um, no, I'm incredibly grateful that I just happened to be the one to kind of go forward with it. And really so much of the credit goes to, you know, the Lucases and the Ryans and Tony and Handel and Sakani and all the rest of these incredible artists who really do have a lot of work on their plate and still uh, find it in their heart to want to spend time with students. So uh, I'm just incredibly grateful I got to be a part of it. So at the beginning of MoGraph Mentor, what were you doing, you know, to, to pay your bills? Were you on staff somewhere? Were you freelance? Yeah, I was freelancing in Portland. So I had three or four different studios that would have me come in and kind of work a few months at a time. So I just was bouncing around to a few different places in Portland. And during that period, I started to really feel inspired of, you know, looking at the art directors and creative directors who were, uh, you know, my bosses thinking like, wow, these people are really talented. You know, this person's this ridiculous visual artist and this person's incredible with clients and really understands the business side of it. And it just would always kind of come into my mind of like, man, it'd be great if students could just t interact with these people directly. Um, so just kind of even being in that environment inspired me to like, man, it, it does make sense to just set up a bit of a system and a brand and try to bring it to people and put a price on it so that it can be sustainable and find a way to reward these instructors for their, for their time and their intellectual property that they provide. Um, so it just always seemed like a good idea to the point where I just felt like, well, I, I have to do this. We should set it up and see what happens. Yeah. Like someone's going to do it. Yeah. Could somebody's going to do it. It's, it's obvious. It's an obviously good idea. So yeah, let's just, yeah, see what happens. So the way you described that, I think it's, I think it'd be pretty fair to call you an entrepreneur. Like the way your brain works seems to be that you recognize an opportunity and you're able to talk yourself into, into going <laughs> after it. So I wanted to ask you like, you know, I've seen your work, your pre-MoGraph mentor work. I mean, you're, you're, you're pretty badass motion designer. Like you get your designs great. You're a great animator too. Um, so, you know, if you have this entrepreneurial side of you and, and, you know, I'm sure you're, you're, there was probably like a lot of reasons to drive you to start MoGraph Mentor. Why not just do the thing that you're already good at? You're already a good motion designer and you could get better and start a studio and scale that way. Yeah. Um, did that ever cross your mind? Why, why did you not go that direction? Yeah, I mean, it did cross my mind. I always saw myself as pretty average, um, you know, on the spectrum of really great designers and animators because I'd done it for a couple of years. Um, and I did feel like I learned a lot from these other incredible people and I'm grateful you know, for every internship and job opportunity um, to learn from these incredible people. And that really grows you so quickly when you get to be in those environments. But I also saw the flip side of it, which is that you could see some studio owners, maybe not say it directly, but almost describe their life as a kind of prison or like a cage. Like once they built that business, they had to work so much, you know, like even the people above me were often working harder than their actual staff. And, you know, there can be a cynicism about spending all your time uh, creating work for companies that maybe you don't believe in, or maybe there's like some ethical side of it. And so, I don't know, I just was never that excited about, after getting to witness it firsthand, I was never that excited about, I should spend all my time and money trying to become, to become an agency. And yeah, I mean, I, I think that I also just really wanted a lot of autonomy over my time, as do many people now. So we see a lot of people going to freelance. And I think once you become a freelancer, you're kind of this independent consultant. You're valuable to different people in different ways, and you're just trying to get hired. And um, that just teaches you a lot about value and exchange of money and kind of the basics of entrepreneurship. So I think even freelancing and getting to experience that side of it just teaches you a lot, actually, that kind of then gives you a path to maybe recognize things that would be valuable as more traditional business models versus just being a freelancer and saying like, Hey, it, it wasn't rocket science to create an LLC for my freelance. It's not rocket science to keep my books and pay my taxes. It's almost rocket science to pay, <laughs> to pay your taxes, right. but it's not exactly rocket science. So it just gives you a bit of a confidence of like, yeah, I could, I could probably solve some of these other problems and get something set up. So you mentioned something. I, I, what, you, what you're talking about when you say the studio owners feel like they're trapped or something like that. I, when I was running my studio, I felt like I was on a treadmill hmm. that was never going to turn off. Yeah, and it, if I just, if you know, if you stop walking, you're going to fall on your face. Um, yeah. And it does feel like that. And that's, you know, that was certainly a motivator to get me out of the day-to-day, -day, you know, studio life and to start 
a, something else. And I, you know, a lot, I would say probably 85% of the people that I talk to these days on this podcast or just out in the industry, they all say the words passive income and I, they don't say them publicly, but I think that's kind of the, that's like a, a little dream that a lot of people in this industry have because traditionally there is no such thing as passive income in motion design. It doesn't exist, right? You're doing work for client, you're trading hours for dollars. Um, were, was that was that part of the calculus too? Like, were you thinking I might be able to build something that's bigger than me, but doesn't require me to be on a treadmill? Did that yeah. play into it at all? Yeah. I mean, I think the other, I think the treadmill analogy is good. And I think some of the studio owners I was around, I think also felt like they weren't like they had done all this incredible work and risked everything, right? Risked every dollar they had and their reputations to create these studios. And then a lot of times don't get to make the work that they feel like they would want to make. So it's like they did all this work to get to this end goal. And then it is a bit of a treadmill. And depending on the dynamics of the economy, you might be doing years worth of things that you really don't want to be doing. So I think that right. was that was kind of part of it too. I'm sorry, what was your what was your last question? Oh, I was just curious, like, you know, when 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 I started when I started School of Motion, I had no idea what it was going to be. Oh, yes. Passive income. Yeah. yeah no, I wasn't, I wasn't super keen on that concept. I hadn't heard that term much either. Um, you know, my dad was pretty entrepreneurial and he always loved to uh, talk about the economy. And he was like a government, you know, U.S. history policy wonk type. And we loved talking about business and entrepreneurship. And um, the excitement of starting a business, definitely I romanticized, but no, that specific idea of passive income. I wasn't, I wasn't keenly aware of at the time. It's interesting to me to see how some studios are, even studios are starting to get into that. You know, we, we talked with Fraser from Cub Studio, uh, and they've developed kind of this side brand called MoShare, where it's essentially like a piece of software that they give their clients and the clients make, you know, variations and versions mm, and stuff oh, like that. And it's a form of recurring income for them. And Zach over at IV in Nashville, they're working on a game because a game is a product. And once you have a product, the product can be sold while you're, while you're sleeping. So um, it's, it's just kind of an interesting trend to, to, for me to notice. Um, so let's talk about the first session of MoGraph Mentor. Uh, so first of all, how, how old is MoGraph Mentor? How many students have gone through your program? Ooh, how many students? Um, probably on the order of about a hundred students have gone through it. Let's say we've had several hundred students enroll and then, you know, there's some dropout kind of flake out rate from that larger number of people going sure. to class one. Uh, the first sessions were in 2014, the beginning of 2014. Okay, so about three years ago, and how how did that first session go when you really had no idea what what was going to yeah. happen? Yeah, well, the first time we ever did a live stream, it was a disaster because we were using Adobe Connect and we had just kind of put it out, and I think like fifty people showed up, and it just crashed and froze the whole <laughs> interface. So the first night was like a disaster. It was like you know, my wife was like, "How'd it go?" And I was like, "Very poorly. It did not go well. We basically right. didn't get to do it because it just kept crashing, and I had to kind of solve that side of it." But then once the semester began, we were running class sizes of 12. I was the, we had about 20-ish people in that first cohort, that first semester. And it was like a beta test at the point. So I was the mentor for both classes. And there's about 10 to 12 people in each group. And that turned out to be a disaster because that's way too many people to do a deep dive, meaningful critique and discussion, it turns out but we had already formatted it and sold it, you know, as such. And so we went through the, you know, that whole first three months um, of doing these class sizes that were way, way too big. So then we immediately cut that in half and said no more than six people. Um, and so that was good to figure that out, solve that problem. And uh, so ever since that's, that's been a lot better, but yeah, definitely lots of uh, stories about a rocky start and, and trying to figure, figure out what was going to work. Yeah, I think that's pretty standard for any startup, especially one that's sort of on the cutting edge. I mean, I know that live streaming software and, and these kind of teleconferencing solutions, they've gotten so much better even just yeah. in three years. But back then it was like the Wild West. And I mean, we tried them all too, go to webinar and yeah. Fuse and all of them, and they all they all had their warts. Um, so you mentioned uh earlier that, you know, you you only have six students uh, 
in each group. So obviously that's something that you learned from that first session. Okay, this is too big. We need to cut this down. Um, I'm, I'm wondering what other things have you improved as as this has gone on? Because it seems from the outside, you've kept the the core curriculum relatively stable. So I'm assuming your procedures, your operations and processes have all improved. So what are the things that, that you've been learning and improving? Yeah, I'd say one big, I mean, we have switched around the structure of projects. Those, the first year taught us about how quickly people could complete the various tasks. Um, so we did restructure, uh, you know, class one originally had three projects and then it just was kind of grinding people way too, way too much. And so then we kind of consolidated and went down to two and kind of split it down the middle. Um, I'd say everything we've ever changed has been in the direction of simplification. Like I probably tried to make things too complicated initially in some way. So just kind of like paring things down to the essentials um, and then the other big one was just incorporating more useful technology. Like you said, Slack has been a huge kind of change for us that we can have, you know, and since we have students all over the world, 24 seven kind of stream of, uh, people having discussions within their private groups or then within the larger group. Um, so just, yeah, just always trying to find ways to, uh, to help connect people in Slack has been pretty huge for that. That's awesome. And you mentioned also that you you mat, you try to match students to mentors. I'm just curious, how do you do that? Like what what are you looking for in the student that that lets you say, oh, this student would be great if I paired them with, you know, Steve Savali yeah. versus, you know, someone else like Lucas? Yeah. Sometimes they'll just tell us and yeah. you know, just make it clear and say, I'm really interested in this person. Um, but now I would, pay, I would probably pick Lucas, by the way. <laughs> I love Lucas. <laughs> yeah, he is, um, he is really something special and his work is incredible. I love that guy. Um, but now we're also trying to break out individual mentors and it's a bit experimental. And we tried it with Colin Hesterly, who's one of our instructors to start actually building live courses around like even more niche expertise, not just the broad general kind of learn design, learn animation, learn the software now getting all the way down to like, you know, directing 2D animated short films with Colin Hesterly, you know, in a six week, eight week course. So you may see us trend even more in that direction in the spirit of trying to help connect people like, you know, people may prefer to work with Tony Zagarios in a kind of broadcast design context more than just even the general program. We want to offer the general program because for some people that's perfect. They're like brand new or they're somewhat new. And they really do need kind of end-to-end -end holistic approach. But then just that continuing education space, which I think, you know, people like Ash Thorpe have proved, you know, with more kind of high level, even more niche specific courses built around the name of the instructors themselves. I think there's a lot of logic to that. So um, you'll probably see us offering more of that type of stuff. I think, honestly, that's the beautiful thing about the state of online learning right now is that it there's a million options. You know, you, you've got fully passive classes at, at lower price points. You've got sort of, you know, st stuff in the middle. And then you've got MoGraph Mentor like one-on-one -on -one with, you know, <laughs> Lucas freaking Brooking, um, you know, and you can take it on your own time. It's not, it's not in this rigid you have to be here for four years kind of thing. All right. So let's move into, let's move into this last, the last time we talked with microphones, uh, Michael was on your podcast and we'll link to it in the show notes. Uh, everyone listening, if you haven't heard that one, um, you should, I got in a quite a bit of trouble with some of my friends <laughs> for some of the things <laughs> I said on that one. Um, anyway, so on that podcast, we had a, a pretty good discussion about sort of the state of the the standard kind of university system and especially the way it teaches art um you know motion design specifically um i we said some incendiary things and we both seem to think that this two hundred thousand dollar you know you said some incendiary thing, things you said blow it up <laughs> I, I, I did say i said i said burn it down yeah i have a bunch of emails quoting me so mm -hmm. i'll never forget mm -hmm. that yes. uh so but anyway um i'm just curious you know that that was three years ago my 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 opinions are generally where they were then yeah. uh they've shifted a little bit but i'm curious to hear your thoughts on that model do you think it's still valid do you think it's going away where, where are you at yeah, I mean, if you're describing a model that says you should pay, you should invest 
let's say $140,000 into learning digital photography, then no, I, I don't believe that's a very valid uh, model. Of course, it's your right. If you have that money, go spend that money. I'm not telling people they shouldn't do that. Uh, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't have my children do it. I wouldn't suggest to anyone asking me for an earnest opinion about it to do it. Um, should you spend $140,000 to learn motion design? Probably not either. Um, should you spend $140,000 to do your undergraduate to become a lawyer so that you can get into Harvard Law? Well, probably. You'll probably make all your money back. So I think it is kind of contextual on how well are those people going to do with those skills. So I think it'd be a really tough sell to say, well, digital photography is such a unique skill set that you really could invest, you know, the cost of a median home to, to learn that when, you know, Creative Live could teach you basically all the same information and then prompt you to start building your portfolio and an understanding of how the business side works, you know, for $59. It's like, no, of course it's not tenable to ask people to, to, to pay that sum of money. So, you know, we definitely have, uh, we definitely have a problem on our hands and yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't see anybody defending that people should do that. Uh, Washington Post wrote an article about how art schools are now consistently the most expensive in the United States, private art schools, even more so than Ivy League schools. I think uh, our friends in Pasadena got the, got the top slot at Art Center, mm -hmm. um, coming in net close to about 40K a year. And I, I mean, I'm torn on that because it's like I talked about with Chris on his podcast, the top 15% of those kids will go on to kind of director level employment, probably within like five to seven years. And maybe it is worth it for those individuals, but a whole larger swath of people probably should be seeking a way, way, way more realistic and affordable way to get those skills. And I think it's no more complicated than saying like that these institutions that have to charge this sum of money because the overhead's already so high, right? They're paying all the pensions and all the salaries and all the huge, gorgeous campuses. That system was necessary when that system was the information transfer mechanism, right? Like you didn't, you know, we had fax machines and, and phones in the 1990s, but it's not like we right. could fax around to everybody and tell them how to do digital photography. It's like you still had to go to a building and find somebody who knew what they were talking about. Um, the Internet just obviously fundamentally blew that up and information has effectively gone to zero marginal cost. Information is effectively free now. Even if you paid, let's say, $59 a month or whatever it is for lynda.com, well, it's like, well, there's 100,000 hours of real, usable, uh, actionable information. So it's like, what is the cost per hour that you're paying? 0. 0.0001 cents. Like information is right. effectively free. Um, but information isn't the whole part of it, right? So information is one part of it. But then, and this can kind of go into the next part of the conversation of, I think now we need to bridge the gap and create new models that allow people to come to the buildings, but without paying that $140,000. Brilliant. Yeah, I've had I've had conversations with Chris Doe about this exact thing, and, it, and he's having a lot of the the same thoughts. And, and most of the criticism that I got um, for for what I said about the university system, and, and and for anyone who doesn't want to take the time to listen, I essentially said I don't think it's worth it at all for specifically mm -hmm. for motion design. Yeah. And frankly, it's silly to to go there. And yeah. and here's here's the the response I got from people who disagreed. And for the record, most people agreed, <laughs> but there were some people that disagreed strongly. Um, you know, you, you, you're exactly right. The information is not the only thing you're getting, right? Uh, when we, you know, in this country, especially when we talk about going to college, it's often positioned as you're going to learn to be an adult yeah. and to kind of get a little bit seasoned, Okay, cool. Uh, you're going to be probably, if you, if you go to a big school, you're going to be around a much wider, diverse group of people than you probably were growing up in your hometown. Okay, that's valid. Um, and, you know, and, and then there's kind of the idea that, like, if you're around other people really doing high level art, it's going to calibrate your eye. Yeah. So I think those are all valid critiques. Yes, um, but I also have this feeling, like you're hinting at, there's a much more efficient way of of doing that. So do you think that the top 15% that come out of Art Center that end up opening imaginary forces and places like that, do you think that they wouldn't 
have been able to do that without going to those schools? Or do you think that it's more the person than the place they go to school? Yeah, that's a hard question. I mean, you know, I witnessed my brother-in-law go to Ringling and do the character animation program. And they really did uh, put him in a position to be ready to apply at the big studios that he wanted to work at. And then they facilitated the connections. So there's also this kind of, is there kind of an insider's track to the best spots in the economy? I don't know the answer to that. Um, could, you know, could people be really, really, really successful without, you know, doing art school? Of course they could. Um, but I don't really know the answer to that. I, I sometimes wonder how much, um, the best agencies and studios and like the top firms in the world, it's almost a prestige thing for them. They want to go to the best university and pick the students. So sometimes I think maybe there is kind of this insider's track, uh, but maybe that's even getting kind of diffused and blown up now as um, it's easier to find the talent and the talent can rise to the top because, you know, it's like it, Lucas with his portfolio, it's like the best firms are going to find him because he's just that good. They're not going to care where he went to school. Right. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a tough question, but I think the points about education, the value of a brick and mortar education is more about a formative experience, right? We're not just robots who just need information and then the problem is solved. It's like, actually, we're highly emotional and everyone is borderline a mess and college is often a time to kind of like sort yourself out and align yourself for the rest of your life, which I actually believe uh, many people can do, and it really is a formative experience. And I've actually really come to be to believe in the value of leaving your house or your bedroom and having to, you know, press your shirt and smell good and go look another human being in the eye. I've actually really come to believe that kind of is the missing part um, going forward. So now that's the thing I'm really excited about pursuing. But yeah, it can't it can't cost one hundred and forty thousand dollars. It should be like four thousand dollars a year. Like maybe you spent fifteen grand over the course of four years. Uh, to me, I think that would be more real, realistic. Awesome. I, I want to get into that in a little bit because I want to see how, how what you what kind of thoughts are going through your head where four thousand dollars is enough to 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 facilitate that. Yeah. Um, let's let's stick with online for a little bit. So you've been running MoGraph Mentor since two thousand thirteen. Uh, and in that time, um, you know, we've kind of popped up, learn squared, the future, all with slightly different models, doing it in different ways. Um and, and and clearly the the market for online training has grown tremendously since then. So I'm curious if if you know you have any thoughts on where this online thing is going. Do you do you think that it's just going to continue to grow and there's going to be more and more content, or do you think people are going to come to the realization that it seems like you have, where it's not you can't just have that. Yeah, I've I think it's all of the above. I think we're at the beginning of a very long runway. I think you know, the explosion in the last three or four years of companies is kind of canary in the coal mine of things to come. I think it's going to multiply really, really quickly, potentially exponentially. Um, I think more people will be kind of like niching down all the way to their most specific expertise and like offering up that information on YouTube or via courses. Um, I do think the larger trend is that it's going to be harder to charge too much for information, right? You can charge money for information when it's scarce, but once it's not scarce, um, it should be almost effectively free. And I think this is something Chris has kind of figured out and he's a little bit ahead of the curve on. So I think it's a good thing. I find Chris and Ash and you incredibly inspiring. I'm so grateful uh, for what each of you are doing because it helps, you know, it's helping me on my journey too. Like we were saying before we started recording, like we're all growing together. It doesn't even necessarily feel like um, competition. I think there's also the demand side to consider in the sense of probably in our lifetimes, another one to 2 billion people could get internet access. And so it just feels like we're at the very, very beginning of a very long runway of growth for, um, especially working with students in international countries who can't come to a brick and mortar, uh, but will get, you know, a Google Pixel book, you know, for 300 bucks or something, and then can take a School of Motion course. So uh, the demand side, I see, we're at the very beginning. Like, I, th I think there's a long way to go. 
Um, and yeah, it's kind of a sorting out period. We're like, okay, well now we have the internet. Now we have social media. So it's really easy to target people and tell them, Hey, if you're interested in this piece of information, I've got it right here, you know, for basically nothing. Um, so it's an, it's an exciting time, but I feel like each of us having these conversations and seeing what is valuable to people and then people on Twitter and Facebook can give immediate feedback that's public for everyone. So it's like, it's like we're all in this giant incubator, just like everything is pretty transparent now and yeah. uh, just kind of like figuring it out. But I think it's a positive and I th where do I think it's headed? I think way more online education than if there is like another big recession or something. I think it'll probably unfortunately crush a lot of traditional institutions, not the best ones, but kind of the middle of the road ones that are already struggling, even when the economy is good. Um, there's going to be a restructuring. Like I think we're going to have to address putting people in buildings at a lower cost. So I think that's going to happen too. And then the way that you get to that lower cost is a lot of the intellectual property isn't in the form of salaried staff. It's a very small amount of salaried staff and then a lot of very affordable information and remote instructors because I think there is a demand for people to want to go directly to the people who have the jobs that they want. Um, so that's yeah, generally where I think it's headed. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And that's kind of been our model. We, you know, the, the information is produced at the highest level we possibly can. But then what really what you're getting when you sign up for a class is this support system yeah. of our teaching yeah. assistants and our community manager and, you know, and, and our and our platform that, you know, it's sort of like the machine that we've built to allow us to critique and things like that. And and I mm -hmm. I see more and more companies doing that. And so I, I, I'm all in with this hybrid kind of model. Um, you, you also mentioned something else really important, which is that this, you know, we're, we're both Americans. And so, you know, we, we probably think it, whether consciously or not from like a U.S. centric viewpoint. Mm, sure. um, but I mean, for students in, say, the Middle East, there are not just, you know, 10 great art schools they can go to that have a motion design program. Mm. Um, and and I know you, MoGraph Mentor, has had students from probably dozens and dozens of countries. We've had students from Syria, from Iraq, Iran, um, Sudan, you know, countries I know very little about. And they write in and they're like, this is great. I have nothing like this in my country. So I, I think that, you know, the you're right, it's going to be all of the above because for students like that, they may not be able to get to the building that you are actually constructing right now that I want to talk about. Um, <laughs> but first, I'm curious, do you yeah. think that, um, d you know, I've been told this before. And I'm not sure how I feel about it. I've been told that some people just can't learn online. It doesn't work for them. They need to be in the room with a human. Do you do you think that's true or do you think that's just kind of like a, an artifact from a previous time? Yeah, I don't doubt that that's true for some people. I mean, it's tough to say they can't do online learning. Like, what does that mean? Does that mean they can't do passive consumption and like sit through a pre-recorded lecture or they can't be in a Skype session with other people? It's like, I don't know anybody who doesn't enjoy being in the web conferencing session. So I think it's a bit of a moving target on what to say online education is. And then you even fast forward that a little bit of like, are we going to jump this thing into VR at some point and get super immersive and it will really feel like, you know, you're in this place. Um, so yeah, I mean, what online education is, is, is continually evolving, but I do think that it favors self-starters. Uh, obviously it's, it favors people a lot of times who kind of already know where they want to go. So then they're like exploiting the things they know will be valuable to them. And I think that's part of why I was attracted to like a general program idea is for those people. And we get it in a lot of our, you know, reviews of the program of like, I just was looking for something that was like, I, I don't want to have to design my own curriculum because I'm so new. I don't know to do that yet. So I wanted something that kind of laid it out for me in a, in a general way. Um, but going back to your point about the Middle East. Um, yeah, we've also had a lot of students from the Middle East. I think there, there's something going on there in the sense of just enormous potential. And I think it's like really heartbreaking because Syria, I mean, we don't need to go into it, but it's like absolutely heartbreaking what's happening in that country. And even right. when people apply and they talk about, you know, everything that's going on in their country and, um, you know, we do discounts and, and try to do scholarships as much as we can because it's like, 
you know, the value of their currency falls out. That's not their fault. And it's like the USD is just this ridiculously expensive uh, instrument compared to some people's um, currency. And we're seeing that a lot out of South America too, which is really sad. But the thing that gives me a lot of hope is, and it speaks to my ignorance of like, oh my gosh, there's people in Syria working on becoming motion designers. There's people in, you know, Somalia who are working on motion design. It was surprising to me at first. Now it isn't surprising to me, of course, when people apply from any corner of the world. And it just proves I've come to see how similar people are and how much potential exists in these countries where if some of these other problems could get solved, it would be just as dynamic and just as expressive and produce world-class art as well. So I think we're, I think we have kind of a flourishing in front of us of a lot of these other countries that were third, third world and are developing more and developing more of a middle class. And then, you know, it's like the old John Adams quote of like, I have to study politics and war and my sons have to study engineering and shipbuilding and agriculture. And so that their sons could, you know, and of course he's just saying sons, but now we mean all people have that privilege to study poetry and art and visual art and music and all of those wonderful things. So I'm pretty optimistic actually about uh, the future of these other countries and people within them kind of having this flourishing because now they can have access to Lucas Brooking. They can have access to Ryan Summer. So the best instructors in the world can work with people in Syria. That is just an interesting potential uh, for, for the future, I think. Yeah, you're almost helping build this worldwide network of apprenticeships and, and internships. And And the only thing missing is you're not in the same room, but you can, you know, there's analogs, uh, you know, digital tools that, that can get you maybe 70% of the way there. And I, you know, my theory is that by the time my kids, so my oldest is seven now. So in 11 years, she would be college aged. Um, and I really think by the time she's that age, there's going to be some other options than just go to college or don't. Uh, you know, I, I really, I believe that and I hope so. Um, so just on a personal note, I'm curious, have you thought about that for you two kids? Like, do you, are you, you know, do you have a, a college savings account for them or are you kind of thinking, you know what, I, I, college may be hit or miss, you know? Yeah. Yeah. What is it? The 527 college savings plan. Do you that, guys do that for your, are you guys saving? We are, for, we're saving a little bit for, for yeah. college. Uh, so, so we're not doing that plan. And for people who are not in who don't have kids or who are not in the U S it's essentially like a tax, tax sort of exemption. Rate. Yeah. It's a tax deduction to save for specifically. Um, however, that money, once you save it is sort of earmarked for college. Yeah. Um, and because, you know, and obviously I'm sort of biased, but I, you know, I really think that college is going to be an option. And like you mentioned, if you want to be my oldest right now says she wants to be a veterinarian. Cool. If mm -hmm. she wants to be a veterinarian, she's, probably going to have to go to college. She's certainly going to have to go to veterinary school. There's no way around that. There's no online course that can teach you to, to you know, fix a, a cat's hernia or something like that. <laughs> However, I don't know that that's what she's going to end up doing. And frankly, I don't know that there's not going to be some better model to do that, you know, to do all of the undergrad stuff, you know, uh, sort of the Chris Doe or the Michael Jones way where there's like a building you go to and then you go to vet veterinary school um, and hopefully the student loan bubble has burst and the prices drop. So we're saving uh, using things that we can convert into cash if our kids don't go to college, which we're not at this point. I'm not really like it's so far away. I'm not really focused on it, but I'm not yeah. just banking on it the way my parents did, where every single person that I went to high school with and was friends with was almost forced to go to college just by society. And I think think that's starting to change. No, we're very similar to you. We're not doing uh, any of the like 527 savings plans. We, uh, we intend to homeschool and my wife and I are very, very skeptical that they'll end up um, at a university. I mean, we have a vision of them being able to, um, you know, attend some of the academies that maybe we're about to start here um, as early as 13, 14, 15. I've just been really encouraged by so many uh, stories and examples of kids who were homeschooled who are doing kind of genuinely brilliant work by the time they're 17 or 18 because this funny thing in homeschooling about 
you can kind of get through all your rote work really quickly. And then there's time to work on the things that you're really interested and passionate about. So, you know, if my daughter wants to be a motion designer at 14, it's like, okay, well, let's, let's start working on visual art. Like, let's, okay, we got to get your history and your algebra and all the other things done. Um, or maybe it's electrical engineering, maybe it's robotics, maybe it's coding. Um, so I don't know. I just have this vision of like college is probably not going to be in their future again. Yeah. If, uh, if you want to do something that requires a government mandated accreditation, that's still a big problem. And I just finished this book called College Unbound, which is a lot about this of kind of the accredited side of things that you're saying, which um, I, I am also very uh, optimistic that there's going to be brand new, way, cheaper ways to meet the accreditation standards um, and figure out how you become that veterinarian without having huge, huge sums of money. Um, because it should stand to reason that you can uh, employ a different model to teach someone to be a veterinarian um, if it can be done for other things as well. So, no, I'm, I'm highly skeptical. We're going to be throwing down 20, 30K a year um, for education. I think that's a privilege of our position and I get to have this education company. So it's like we're in a great position to do that. Um, so I'm not saying that's necessarily right for everyone. But, yeah, I, I have a hard time imagining them doing that. I'm really glad to hear you say that, man. And by and by the way, we actually homeschool our kids too. So we'll okay. have to, uh, oh, nice. we'll have to, yeah, there we'll have go. to, yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to get into that. It's uh, so this kind of speaks to a larger thing, which you know, it's really hard for me to say because um, when when you homeschool your kids and you hang out with other families that homeschool, and uh, you know, tomorrow we're going on a camping trip with a bunch of homeschool families. Um, you get to be a little bit insulated from the true state of what education is, at least in the United States for, you know, where I live. Um, and, you know, it sounds like you and I are both sort of skeptical in general of just kind of the state of education. I'm curious if, if you could talk a little bit about your, your thoughts on, you know, never mind learning motion design and, and online yeah. training and stuff. Just in general, I feel like the whole idea of what it means to teach and to learn is changing. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Certainly. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's been pretty well documented by people. Um, the other book I just finished was called The End of College, which I would encourage people to check out by Kevin Carey, if you're really interested in going deep on this of just, I mean, it's been well talked about that our kind of model of education K through 12 came from kind of a post-World War II, more consolidated era when it's like just teaching people to read and write was like a really good path. Um, and just people had highly similar jobs. It was like the age of mass manufacturing and this idea of huge employment of people having really similar jobs. And I just think this bomb of like highly specialization, everything's fracturing down and niching down to the smallest possible level that just the general kind of one size fits all is there's a lot of pressure on it right now. I mean, in terms of homeschooling, we just feel like it's a it's like a quality of education thing. And it just came through examples. We've just had this weird, unfortunate luck of like everywhere we've lived, seemingly connecting with families that were in homeschool networks and also knowing other people whose kids are in public school. And of course, this is anecdotal, but I see a noticeable difference in maturity um, in a lot of different areas on kids who are, who are homeschooled. And even speaking to parents, they will kind of talk about the psychological aspect too, of just like the pressures of eight, nine, 10, 11th grade, where everything's social. Does the boy like me? Does the girl like me? There's like bullying. There's just a lot of nonsense and time wasting in public education is like what I get a sense. And even in my own experience of like nonsense and time wasting is a pretty good description of my time in high school. I would have done a lot better, probably, probably in a different environment where I did have, because I was so like technically minded, where I could just be like taking apart a toaster, watching an online thing and learning the basics of electrical engineering, like things I could really sink my teeth into versus the, oh, school sucks. Let me just get through this test. This is lame. When's the weekend? Um, so I think it's anecdotal and it's part of our own experience between my wife and I of just feeling like, man, we want something. We want something better for our kids. You brought up a really good point, which is one of the big reasons that we decided to homeschool um, was it, it seems like traditional education uh, is really become very focused on getting a consistent result kind of at all costs. And 
you know, I, I'm, I know you've seen this through MoGraph Mentor. We see it all the time through School of Motion. And anyone who's ever taught knows this, that people learn in such wildly different ways and at different speeds. And just because two people are eight years old doesn't mean that they both have the same capabilities at eight. Mm. Learning curves vary wildly. Um, and, and, you know, I really feel like it, it, motion design is a great example. To be a successful motion designer today, I think it's more valuable to be a problem solver and ha- know how to have a process to figure things out and make things versus knowing all the buttons in After Effects, right? Um, and that's, I guess I would use that as an analogy for like the way public education, try, especially in Florida around us, really big on test scores and memorization and, and numbers, reading a certain number of pages per day and your parents' signs to say that you did that. Verse, yeah. yeah, versus just... just Versus wanting to read for the exactly, sake of knowledge. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't you know, that be strange? And, yeah. and, and, and putting kids in situations where they are probably going to fail and embracing that and saying that yeah. that's, that's a valuable thing. Um, that's one yeah. of the things we, we really try to do one of the first things we do in most of our classes uh, when students are in orientation is we give them a problem that we think they'll fail at. Um, mm-hmm. We want them to try and fail and feel that pressure. And then at the end, after you know eight or 12 weeks, we give them something similar to do and they can do it. And um, I, you know, there's that, that sense of accomplishment that seems to be beaten out of a lot of the kids that, that, that I see going through it. I don't want to bash public schools too much because it's, it's a landmine. I know they're not all like that. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm grateful that the alternative could be worse, certainly, yeah. you know, 75, 90 years ago, just living on the farm, you got no education. It's like exactly. it's certainly superior that yes, to have that. So that's, yeah, I think a proper context. So let's talk about what you've been up to. So, uh, Michael and I are our buddies on Facebook and you recently posted some pretty intriguing photos and some kind of CG mock-ups of something you're building over there. So I was wondering if you could tell us about that. Yeah. So kind of per our conversation, I've been pretty obsessed with the idea of kind of taking the efficiency of all this free information. But like we said, how do we create a more formative experience where people have to show up and be in the room? Um, And I also have a bit of a theory as to getting all those people to show up and be in the room creates more dynamism for the people online. So I feel like there's this virtuous, possibly kind of feedback loop that we could build. And so it's pretty simple. I want to start a series of campuses. The first one's going to be in the Raleigh-Durham Metro, um, hopefully uh, launching now. Actually, we've moved the timeline up a bit, potentially kind of the end of spring 2018, um, to basically create an environment that is like part part university, part internship, uh, part you know online education lab, part business incubator. So these spaces uh, will be available to students. We're going to have to limit the number of slots, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, they'll pay four ninety nine a month, so that's five hundred dollars a month. If you were to do an eight month school year, it's about four thousand dollars. So this comes to the kind of ten x solution. If it's forty thousand dollars a year, well, reverse engineer what you could do for four thousand dollars a year. Well, what you can do for $4,000 a year probably is have a kind of artist uh, or instructor in residence who gets paid pretty well to have a person on the ground. Let's say someone like you, if we were going to start one in Sarasota. um, Let's do it. Enough to have a TA, a very legitimate TA also on the ground. And then some other kind of smaller assistant type things um, to have access to computer labs and then have... um, simply an internet connection to then leverage all of the intellectual property that exists online and to just basically be kind of a problem solvers academy. And whether that's in the visual art program, the entrepreneurs program, or the uh, developers programs, we're going to have kind of three tracks. Um, And we're hoping uh, to also add a journalism, a digital media and journalism track in there as well. We want this academy to Number one, serve as a tool for what people call a gap year. If there's someone who isn't exactly sure what they'd like to do at university, um, they probably shouldn't go spend that 40 grand to find out what they'd like to do. Maybe what they should do is come to the academy, spend four grand, do a bit, do a bit of visual art, perhaps do a bit of development, do a bit of entrepreneurship, maybe something in the journalism realm, like test things out, have that gap year where we 
where we want that kind of internship environment where they're making things, they're building a portfolio, they're understanding really what these jobs might look like to kind of get a sense of um, if they feel they'd like to pursue it. So I could see a scenario in which someone comes in, does, uh, you know, visual within the visual art track, does that for a year and says, you know what, this is it. Now I'm going to go to Ringling. Now I'm going to go be in that top 15%. I would feel pretty pleased if I could create something that helps people make better decisions at that point in their life. The other side of it, of course, is then just continuing it continuing education. We're not just going to limit it to uh, people within that 18, 19, anybody who, you know, is working on a business or wants to improve as a motion designer or illustrator or 3D artist or someone who maybe wants to uh, launch something within journalism or wants to learn HTML and CSS and Python and learn to become a developer um, that, you know, we're going to put together a schedule and it's going to be project based and there's going to be presentations every Friday. So that's kind of my favorite part of this little scheme is like, you're going to have to be in the hot seat. So there's your motivation right there to uh, get off your butt and do everything you need to do Monday through Thursday, uh, or else it's going to be embarrassing on Friday. And I think kind of that component of that's the thing I love about potentially the live environment, right? Is like having to uh, present yourself to your peers appears to be a really, really good motivator for human beings. So the idea is to create some, some guidelines and some leadership and some schedules and then charge people really for what they use, which is being in the buildings, using the electricity, paying for the staff that you really need on site, paying for remote staff, which is a much lower marginal cost where most of the savings come from, and then access to resources, right? I should, you know, they should be able to go right over into the computer lab, get on Cinema 4D. They don't have to buy it. Um, so that... Uh, that's about as complicated as the idea is. And then the goal would be to have multiple campuses that can link up, um, you know, through these same kind of things we're talking about. And, you know, five years from now, I have four or five different spaces um, and we're all kind of collaborating and connecting and it's working for the students. Then I will, uh, then I'll count it as success. That sounds like utopia, man. I love, I, I love the idea of it. Oh, because it's, so there's that. Yeah, there's that. Exactly. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I, I have a bunch of questions about this, but just as as an overall vision, it's exactly the type of thing that I hope exists. So, like, I, I'm so glad that that you're going after this because I, you know, doing the online thing is, I think, really an effect. It's an effective way to learn. It's democratizing, um, but I, and I've said this publicly before that it's it's never going to compete with the experience of being in the room with people. Maybe that'll change. We get, everyone gets VR helmets and it actually yeah. does feel like you're in the room with them, but currently, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, yeah. it's maybe 80%, um, you know, of the equation, um, in terms of effectiveness. So what you're doing is you're, you're, and it sounds like you're going to leverage some of that too. I mean, is this a completely in-person thing? You got to be there five days a week or you just go at certain times? Yeah. Five days a week, 10 hours a day is when the Academy will be open. So you could log 50 hours a week if you wanted to. I imagine it will probably break out in certain ways of people who have kind of part-time jobs and they'll leverage it for a certain amount of hours or some people who really do come every, um, every single day of the week. But I mean, I'm almost thinking of it more, I really don't want this to like go around and be associated with the branding because I don't love the way it sounds, but almost like an educational club in the way you would like pay to be the member of a CrossFit gym and have a personal trainer kind of just in terms of the economic relationship. Um, so yes, people use their clubs in different ways. Like people, you know, some people are at the country club all day. Some people are at CrossFit every single day. Some people are three days a week. Um, so that's going to be the kind of model. And I want it to actually be very flexible of like, it basically works on 30 day modules. There's no contracts. If at the end of the one month you're done. Okay, great. If, if that helped, if that helps some, you know, something align or be clarified, then that's great. Like it's all about the students, um, you know, money back guarantee. If you went through that 30 days and you're like, this sucks, fine. I'll give you your, I'll give you your $500 back. No questions asked. Um, so it's just like, I just want to reverse engineer all my pet peeves about my educational <laughs> experience. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's like this next, you know, like how MoGraph Mentor felt like an obvious idea. This one's kind of in that same thing. Like this just feels obvious. And I, pretty sure it'll work and it'll work. Um, it's, it's break even 
on the site costs probably at around 26 or 27 individuals at the campus. At 50 to 60 people per campus, it's a home run. So if I can find 50 to 60 people who are a good fit for this within the 1.1, I think it's 1.1 million people in the RDU Metro, um, then, then I think we've got something. If it's like 12 people show up, then yeah, I've, I've got a big problem. So we'll see. I don't know. The way you described it, it's a, it's a pretty good sales pitch. So what, what's like a day in the life of one of these students? How do, you know, how does it work? Are they all, yeah. they just go there and they look, they yep. get on show YouTube up. and learn? Like, how does it work? Well, yeah, show up at 8 a.m., you know, get your cup of coffee, hang out, get settled in. Uh, 9 a.m. to 11 is going to be lab. So I'll be yapping away or we're going to Skype somebody in and be yapping away. Uh, you know, we'll be doing demos or we'll be having guest speakers or we'll be having, you know, panels. Um, and then in the afternoon, it's just, um, you know, kind of open time. Now it's time to go work, work on your projects. And then Friday will be the hot seat. Friday will be presentations. Like give us, give us uh, your status. Where are you at? Let's get some feedback. Let's have the discussion. Um, and then within that 30 days, there's going to be, you know, a 30 day goal that they have to hit. There'll be a weekly goal, but um, so if you're a visual artist and you're saying, I want to learn motion design and I'm totally new, well then, okay, we're going to lay out your next 30 days as, well, you're going to week one, you're going to do some after effects tests, then you're going to do some Photoshop illustrator stuff and then integrate it into, um, after effects. So I, I don't see it as terribly different than a regular university in the sense of part of the time you're just leading your own development and getting into it and working in the software or kind of developing your ideas. And then part of the time you're getting some kind of intellectual property or kind of critique and feedback via lectures and, and group sessions. Um, so it's, it's pretty informal. It's still kind of taking shape a bit. And I assume once it's really up and running, then like you said, we'll continue to learn and figure out um, how it works. But the goal is just to redefine the relationship between being in a building um, and and pursuing your education. Now, the big thing still is accreditation. And I know when I go to college fairs this spring in RDU to start pitching this, the question will be, well, do I have credits? Will, will, will there be credits that transfer? And the answer to that is going to be no. This is in no way involving accreditation. And um, that's still a weakness. That's still a problem, certainly. Uh, but I, I think we're kind of getting to a point where people understand that the accreditation isn't everything, like especially those gap year type kids or people more on the informal side of the economy, like you're an artist and the credits really don't matter. Um, so yeah, well, I guess we'll, we'll see how it goes. And I'm assuming that this, you know, the, the $4,000 a year price tag, that's not going to include a top of the line gym and a cafeteria <laughs> with every kind of, no, with a sushi no. bar. And, and, Absolutely and, not. Yeah, gotcha. God, it really does sound incredible, man. And and I, I can't wait to see what happens uh, in 2018 with this because uh, th this is exactly the type of thing I think, you know, guys like you should be should be trying. And, and you know, on paper, it sounds awesome, man. And uh, shoot, I might, I might sign up for it. So, uh, <laughs> so you're going to, you're going to start this venture and what's going to happen with uh, MoGraph Mentor? Yeah, I mean, MoGraph Mentor will uh, continue to grow. I actually think this will help. This will benefit MoGraph Mentor in that, you know, right now my operation is just me essentially at the physical location. I'm out here in Bend on our property, working out of this home studio, and it's really great. It's really comfortable. But I can already kind of see into the future and see once I have this more of a nine to five, and I'm going to be giving myself more of a nine to five with this. Um, and a larger central administrative and marketing team, um, as well as content production team, I think will actually help us meet a lot of our 2018 goals on MoGraph Mentor, which is a lot of new course creation and kind of like we talked about continuing to create paths directly to the artists. So trying to spin off classes, you know, with Tony and Matisse and Lucas and Handel and, and the rest. So um, no, MoGraph Mentor is still a huge, huge priority. We're going to spend more money to try to do better administratively and in marketing. So I actually see this as potentially a multiplier to make that better, hopefully. That's so great, man. So let's end it with this. Um, you know, you're, it's, it's, it's been really fascinating to, to watch MoGraph Mentor grow and, and, and read your blog posts and listen to your podcasts and stuff like that. I mean, you're, 
I almost want to call you a futurist at this point. You're really like thinking pretty forward. Um, and you have two children. I'm curious what, you know, if you sort of project forward um, and they grow up and they decide they want to learn motion design. How do you imagine them being able to do that in, you know, in 10, 15 years? Yeah, I think it will be something like an academy like this. And again, you know, there are other people already doing this. There is a place called the New Digital School in Porto, Portugal. That it, basically, this is what they're doing. There's the Lambda School uh, out in Silicon Valley that is actually free until you get a job, which is a really interesting model. Um, there is the Iron Yard, which is like focused on development. I think they might have like 20 or 30 locations. I haven't looked into them in a while, but um, they've been doing really good. So if they want to go into what I always refer to as a more informal part of the economy, like the creative side of the economy, um, then they're going to have a hell of a lot of options like, like create Academy, which we're creating, or, you know, if I feel like everything's going to go this direction in the way that like MoGraph mentor was kind of new for a minute within its niche. And then in a couple of years, it's like, well, it's so obvious now there's just tons of stuff. I actually see a similar trajectory um, especially as buildings become cheaper, right? There's like whole swaths of the country in which infrastructure is just sitting around rotting and is super cheap. Um, and so if the big institutions can't like figure their thing out, I think a lot of new startups are going to try to offer, offer stuff like this. That's some somewhere between a co-work and a university that like really strips things down, but people can still, um, get a really great education and pursue what they want to pursue. Um, so yeah, I think, I think, I think she would have a ton of options or he would have a ton of options if they wanted to go into that side of the economy. Well, I hope it happens, man, because uh, I want to send my kids to your uh, Create Academy. Okay. That sounds like so much fun, dude. Um, we looked at Sarasota for the first location. You guys are running a little high on prices, though, down there. I got to well, say, you get those prices down and we'll, we'll come on down and put a campus down there. Yeah, you got all these retirees down here and they just have too much money. You know, that's the problem. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm just uh, glad you guys and the whole area dodged a bullet there this last uh, end of summer here with with all the hurricanes. Awesome, yeah. Well, uh, thanks for thanks for saying that, man. Uh, we we definitely did, and uh, I definitely want to have you back on uh, the podcast next year once this thing gets off the ground and talk about it a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, man. I, I always appreciate you, and uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. Check out MoGraphMentor.com to learn more about their classes. And I suggest following Michael on social media. He's a brilliant guy. He's doing some really interesting things in the education space, and you can learn a lot from him. All the show notes for this episode are available at SchoolOfMotion.com. And while you're there, why not sign up for a free account and start getting our weekly Motion Mondays newsletter? It's a very short email you get each Monday with a few bullet points to catch you up on the previous week's doings in the world of motion design. Tens of thousands of artists all over the world get the email, and you should too. That's it for this episode. Adios.